I'm very happy to be here and so today I will speak about uh, universal optimality of E8 and the leech lattice. And so this And so today I will explain what universal optimality is, what, what, what is this property. And uh, during the next uh, five lectures, I will try to prove, to prove this property. And so this, mm, this notion of uh, universal optimality, it comes from the field of energy minimization. So here is a very classical problem considered in mathematics and physics, sometimes in computer science. So we have uh, some metric space and in this metric space uh, we, we want to choose a co collection of points and we suppose that these points interact with each other. And the uh, energy of interaction, it depends only on pairwise distances between points and the set. And uh, then the game we are playing, we are trying to minimize this energy. And so, uh, uh, in this series of lectures, we will not speak about general metric spaces, but we will speak about Euclidean space. And so, so here is the our. And so let's I'll just form formalize what I have just said. So what we do, we fix some potential function or potential profile. So it would be function from the interval zero infinity, which is uh, somehow the values which uh, distances between points can take. And it takes values in the so our energy is always real, positive or negative. And so now if we have a for example a finite set, so we say that potential P energy of a finite set. in the Euclidean space, it will be the following quantity. So this will be the, the sum over all <coughs> pairs of points. And we assume points to be <coughs> different. So self-energy is not taken into account, as in many physical problems. So then we would like to minimize a quantity like this. And so here, this straight brackets, they denote the Euclidean norm. And so, n but of course, uh, somehow because we're working in a Euclidean space, maybe being able to compute this energy only for finite sets is not very interesting for us. Uh, because, uh, for example, we, we think about uh, possible, for example, physical applications, and then we want to study something like a crystal. Uh, so we would like to also to give a definition which would work for infinite conf configurations. Uh, but again, somehow doing, giving a reasonable definition which works for all sets, it's a bit too difficult. So we will restrict ourselves to good subsets, so namely we call them point configurations. And so a point configuration in the Euclidean space, it would be uh, non-empty discrete subset
of the Euclidean space. And so what it means, it means that uh, every ball, so every closed ball, it contains only finitely many elements of this set. And so <coughs> now what we can do, now we can define energy for, so maybe just small piece of notation for the future, so we will denote by b with lower index r of x, which will depend on d, it will be the closed ball of radius r about x in the Euclidean space. And so now how do we compute the energy of an uh, point configuration, which might contain infinitely many points? Uh, so we do it by limiting procedure. So what we take, we will take uh, our uh, so, so we'll take all pairs of points which lie in the intersection of our configuration with an open ball of radius r about zero. And then I compute the energy of this subset. But now what I will do, I will take this r bigger and bigger and bigger. And so now I will also need what I will need. I will need some kind of a renormalization. I will divide this uh, energy by the number of points in the intersection. And so now I would like to take a limit of as r goes to infinity. And of course, such a limit might not exist for some configurations and for some potential sp. So I take a limit inferior. And so I will call this quantity, this will be the lower p energy of a point configuration. And so, uh, as we see in this definition, so this uh, lower energy, it is something like uh, av average energy of interaction of uh, one point with all the others. So for this, we need this normalization factor here. And so now, in some cases, uh, just the limit like this would exist. And then we say that this is not the lower energy, but just the p energy of C. So now if the limit exists of the same expression as here. So then this number, it's uh, the P energy of C. And so just a small remark is that uh, with this definition, so our uh, energy, P energy, it can be uh, some real number or it can be minus or plus infinity. So. And so now what we want to do, we want to, uh, as what the num name says, energy minimization, we want to find uh, uh, configurations with minimal possible energy. But now to somehow to rule out uh, 
to tri trivial solutions, we need to introduce another notion, which is the notion of uh, density of a configuration. So we say that, so that the point configuration It has density rho. If the following holds, if the following limit exists, and equals to rho. So the no, so the density it would be the average number of points per volume, and we compute it in an obvious way. So we take our configuration again, intersect it with a big ball with center at zero and divide every all this by the volume of the ball. And if this number exists, then we say that it is a density of our configuration. Uh, <coughs> and so now when we try to, so let's, Maybe before we come to minimization, let's do a few examples which will illustrate these two concepts. So one nice example of a configuration in Euclidean space, it is a lattice. So So suppose that lambda is a lattice. And so in this case, so the density of lattice, it is just uh, the inverse of its co-volume, so the density. It will be just 1 over the, over its co-volume. And so also now we can apply our definition of P energy. And then we see that the p-energy of a lattice will be the following quantity. So and it will be this number, assuming that the sum converges uh, absolutely. Are you assuming any positivity properties on P? Uh, not at the moment. But okay, let, 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 this will come, come in a bit later. But actually, in the, for the energies we are interested in, they will be positive. So they will do consider repelling potentials. And uh, yeah, also, this uh, assumption will be true. So, so we'll consider energies which have a like, fast decay. Of course, our general definition it uh, allows also maybe to define number when this con assumption is not true, but uh, yeah, we will not consider examples like, like this. Or maybe we'll consider one of them, but later in the series of lectures. And so here is another example which will play a role a bit later. So the lattices are very nice configurations, uh, but unfortunately there are too few of them. So because being a lattice, it's a very re restrictive condition. Uh, so we would like to relax it a, bit, a little bit. And instead of considering lattices, what we can do, we can consider periodic configurations. So from an analytic point of view, con uh, periodic configurations are still nice. They have usually well-defined density. Also, it's easy to compute the P energy for periodic configuration, and uh, at the same time, we can say that uh, almost any configuration can be somehow approximated by a periodic one, at least if it's uh, in some reasonable sense. So, so let's consider now the next example would be periodic configurations.
So for this, we fix a lattice. Lambda. And then the configuration is lambda periodic. If uh, C plus L, it will be again C for all elements in lambda. And in this case, it's also very easy to compute the density. So density, it will be the number of uh, elements of C modulo lambda. And because we know that configurations, they're discrete sets, so we know that this is some finite number. Again, divided by the co-volume of lambda. And so maybe what's a bit more involved computation, it is how to compute the energy. So here again, we assume that uh, our potential decays fast enough. So what we can do, we can take sum over all elements of C mod lambda, and we will consider separately <coughs> x and y, which are uh, different modulo lambda. And then we have a sum like this, sum over all elements in the lattice. And in the case if uh, x and y coincide modulo lambda, then we, we just have to sum over the lattice without zero element. We will get a sum like this. And so now let's define, so now what does it mean to minimize uh, P energy? So maybe, maybe at this point you have some questions to the examples. Oh, yes, yes, you're right, you're right, you should. Thank you. Yes, right. Thank you. And so now what we would like to do, we would like to fix uh, our uh, potential and to find the configuration which minimizes the P energy. Of course, here one obvious problem is that, uh, for example, if our pot potential is repelling, then the points will just like go away to infinity. We'll get something like that empty configuration is the best or that points should be as far away from each other as possible. And so one way to overcome this is uh, what is sometimes done in physics to make, uh, to, uh, to somehow ch change the shape of a potential which uh, somehow makes this uh, trivial solution impossible. And another way, the way which we will, as which we will choose, uh, we will f fix the density. We will say that we are searching for a minimum only among configurations with some fixed density. And so here is the definition. So we say that again, so let C be a point configuration. And so configuration, and suppose that it has this density rho. And we assume that rho is a positive integer. And also let P uh, not integer, sorry, re positive real number. Yes. And let P be any function uh, then we say that C minimizes P 
energy. If its p energy exists, and every other configuration, so every configuration in the same Euclidean space of the same density. has of this time has lower p energy at least equal to this number and so another well, terminology for this is to say that c would be a <coughs> ground state for p Terminology stole, stolen from physics. And so now what we in general expect, we expect that of course this uh, so ground states, they will so So now, what, what happens if we, for example, fix density and then change our uh, energy profile? Somehow we expect that, of course, the set of ground states, it will also change for, uh, together with the uh, energy profile. And it's quite easy to come up with uh, easy examples like that. But uh, <coughs> maybe, maybe there is a nice uh, family of uh, P energies such that several energies have the same ground state. And so, so these questions, they bring us closer to the notion of uh, universal optimality. So, so, so how all the ground states. I'll do the ground states depend on the energy profile P. And so first uh, idea is of course that uh, they can depend a lot. And so here's one example. So let's consider a Gaussian core model. And let's look at it in our favorite Euclidean space, R3. And so Gaussian core model, it's uh, quite often used in uh, physics and, and chemistry. So first it is uh, quite simple. On one hand, and on the other hand, uh, it is also rather r realistic and useful. So what we do here, we fix uh, some positive number alpha, and we define our potential function to be the Gaussian with this exponent. And so now, <coughs> here uh, one uh, uh, observation, it is that because of the uh, this, uh, symmetries Gaussian has, it is uh, what we can do, we can fix uh, a density and change exponent alpha and study ground states. Or on the other hand, what we can do, we can fix uh, alpha, for example, to be pi and uh, then change densities and search for ground states for different densities. And this will be essentially the same problem. So here it's, so what we can do, so fix uh, row and change alpha and see how ground states will depend on alpha. And this is actually equivalent to the uh, 
you're fixing alpha, which I like to be pi, and then change density rho. And because this is somehow uh, <coughs> used more often, maybe let me just use this ter terminology for, for a moment. And so if uh, we have fixed alpha, oops, sorry, and therefore our energy becomes this function. So what experiments tell us about ground states for different densities? The first is if density is uh, smaller than one or maybe much smaller than one, then we know that uh, uh, face-centered cubic lattice it seem, seems to be the, the winner in this case. And so prob so what is a fate center cubic lattice? It's a lattice like this, which, it, for example, it gives us the best packing. It would take a usual cubic lattice, Z3, and then in the center of each uh, face of uh, cubes, which, are the, which give us a tiling of uh, Euclidean space, we choose one more, one more point. And now if rho is uh, bigger than one, then here it seems like that there is another obvious winner, which would be a body center cubic lattice. And this lattice is actually uh, dual to each other after right scaling. And the body center cubic lattice, it looks like this. So again, we have uh, we take a us usual cubic uh, lattice Z3, and now we add one more ball in the center of each of these cubes, which we can imagine they are tiling our whole uh, space. So this will be a geometrically different lattice, and for uh, big values of rho, this one seems to be the best. So we see that there is certainly a dependence of uh, uh, of ground states on the energy, even for this very nice family of potentials. Now it's diff difficult to come up with a ni nicer family. Uh, but now something quite interesting happens around uh, density which equals to one. And so this was observed in the uh, 70s by uh, Stillinger. So what he have found that if uh, density is about, is close to one, uh, then actually phase coexistence of these two lattices, it will have better energy than each of them separately. So, and so how it looks like, so we divide our Euclidean space into two parts, and here we consider so our total uh, density has to be rho, but we make, for example, half of them to be like rho 1 and another half rho 2, such that their average is rho. And on this side, we, for example, arrange our points in a maybe FCC lattice of density rho, so we have to rescale it. And on this side, we make it as a BCC lattice of another density. And because of this play with different densities, it turns out that we can achieve some improvement. Sorry? How is this possible? It's going to be a boundary effect. Uh, yeah, yeah but, but, but boundary does not play that much role, right? Because like, the dimension of the boundary is uh, small. Right, and so like in at least in terms of our definition, somehow the density of all things is still well defined, and the energy is still well defined, right? Exactly. That's that's why I don't understand how it can help what he proposed. No, no, no. no, no. Yeah, I think it it, it, ha it happens because uh, because he has he has two different densities on two different sides, and okay, so it has to do with the convexity of this. You can draw a graph of like how. Uh, how, for example, the energy of uh, such a lattice depends on density and how uh, energy of this one depends on it. 
and then around one there is something like a king and he uses this king to create an improvement. So in the okay, after, okay, so maybe it doesn't, it's not something very strict right now, but okay, so it looks like, would look something like this. No, maybe not like this. Maybe, maybe, oh, okay, maybe I should not, so not draw it. But he does use the somehow convexity properties of these two graphs of uh, the energy of this lattice, how it depends on density, and energy of this lattice, how it depends on density. So we see that uh, uh, the ground state and it can depend in some rather complicated way. Can I just ask one yes. Just to make sure that I'm not totally mad. Is it true that rho is equal to rho one plus rho two over two? Mm, yes, I suppose, I suppose so. Yes. Okay, I'm not mad. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, how, however, so universal, but universal optimality, it is exactly this uh, phenomenon that in some metric spaces we can find a very like a, some n nice family, uh, natural family of potentials. For example, like Gaussians, and uh, the, the same configuration will be a winner for all elements in this family. And now, so to make it a bit more uh, formal, we will need one definition. So we say that the function g, again from the interval 0 infinity to the real numbers, is completely monotonic. if it is infinitely differentiable and satisfies the following condition. So it has to be like a perfect repelling potential. So it is uh, positive, it is decaying, and it is uh, convex. So, and this pattern goes with all the derivatives. So it's deri deri derivatives, they have alternating uh, signs. And so this will be true for all positive k, for all non-negative k. And here is one example. So what kind of function is this? For example, an exponential function with a negative exponent will satisfy this condition. So and so <coughs> here is the definition of uh, universal optimality, which was given by Henry Cohn and Abhinav Kumar. So they say that a configuration is universally optimal if it is a minimizes energy for all functions p, which are completely monotonic functions of a squared distance. So it is a slightly stronger condition than just being completely monotonic. So
So we say that. Uh, so now a, a point configuration. C with density, with some positive density. Rho is universally optimal. if it minimizes P energy P so whenever P is a completely monotonic distance of uh, a completely monotonic function of squared distance. So P it is G of R squared and G is completely monotonic. <coughs> it's really bizarre definition. Do you really need can one have just hundred derivatives? Do you really infinitely many derivatives of so the sense? It's kind of strange. Mm. Yeah, but uh, but I think it is actually mm, necessary. So yeah. at least at least uh, there are configurations which uh, do 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 this. So no, no, okay. yeah, no, I, mean, I mean I mean I mean we need to have like less less conditions on uh, on, on G. Yeah. On, on G. Yeah, power laws, okay. Uh, yeah, the power laws are uh, also are also fall into this uh, cat category. Yes. And Yukawa potentials. Too? Sorry. Yukawa, Yukawa potentials. Oh. It's exponent of one over R. So okay, so th this I'm not I'm not sure about. Maybe maybe. Mix of power and exponential. It's a Bessel function in higher dimension. Anyway. Yeah, but maybe okay, maybe 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 not because so be Bessel function sounds like it's something oscillating, right? So. This okay, but okay, maybe yeah, but this I have to. Check the, <laughs> the the condition. Okay, so I've lost the And so here is a small uh, remark. So now to be, if you want our function to be, uh, sorry, configuration to be universally optimal, it actually it's sufficient that uh, it minimizes uh, energy for all uh, Gaussians. So. And this happens because of the following theorem, which is quite old and classical. Probably it's theorem by uh, Bernstein, at least in some of its formulations. And it says that every completely monotonic function can be written as a convergent integral of the following shape. For some measure on measure mu on the interval zero infinity. Uh, oh, it's uh, not explains my question. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's explains. It. I was surprised why this thing is very dirty, but notation is actually not. Yeah, we use R, mimic R squared. It's kind of 
Yeah, it's, it's kind of confusing. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but again, like to, to use the R squared, it is somehow stronger condition, and because somehow if you have a uh, no, 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 no. Yes. I see. Because I think if we because it's not a very difficult computation, but if we uh, had something which was, uh, so for example, if here function p, it also will be completely monotonic if it's a. Uh, But somehow, just completely monotonic is not uh, enough for us for our needs. And so, for example, uh, like a corollary for, for this would be so that that C is universally optimal. It is equivalent to C minimizes. The energy for P equals to the E minus alpha R squared. And here for all positive alpha. And so, so now I have a question how do I bring back the upper? Blackboard. Uh, ah, ah, okay. Thank you. And so now we gave this very nice definition. So not we, but uh, Henry Cohn and Abhinav Kumar gave this definition. But now, of course, the question is, uh, is there at least one object which satisfies this definition? And as we have seen in, for example, in dimension three, we don't hope for an object like this. So in dimension three, it would not exist. And so, Kohn and Kumar, they actually st studied the same question also in uh, compact metric spaces, like on uh, spheres and projective sp spaces. And they found many particular uh, examples of this universally optimal configurations. And they also found a few in Euclidean space. So first, easy, rather easy example. It is that the uh, lattice of integer numbers in dimension one, it is universally optimal. Which is, of course, maybe not so surprising because what can be better than the lattice of integers? So, so the <coughs> integer numbers inside of R, it is universally optimal. And they've also conjectured the universal optimality for the few more lattices. So they conjectured that the A2 lattice, which is a hexagonal, usual hexagonal lattice in R2, and also uh, E8 lattice, which lives in eight dimensional Euclidean space, and the Lich lattice, which lives inside 24 dimensional Euclidean space, that these three lattices are also universally optimal. And so now the uh, theorem which I would like to present at this series of lectures, it's a joint result obtained together with Henry Cohn and 
Abhinav Kumar, uh, Steven Miller, and Danilo Ratchenko. And so it says that the lettuce is E8 and the leech lettuce They are universally optimal. In two cases still open. Uh, one case is open. So Z is now A two. A two, yes, A two, yes. A two is still open. And, uh, uh, somehow it turns to be more difficult than E8 and leech lettuce. Yeah. yeah, but maybe I will come to this a little bit the, in the last lecture. So I'll see why, why, why things which works in big dimensions, why they don't work in small dimensions. And so maybe now what, uh, I don't know, would, would you like to make a small break? Maybe maybe we can make a small five minute break, and uh, yeah, th then I will explain tell a bit more about the methods of of the proof. And so at the second uh, part of the lecture, I would like to speak about methods of the proof of this theorem. And so the proof it. Uh <laughs> <laughs> In print, yeah, yes. So it it, it does follow from uh, this result after yeah after some lim limiting uh, procedure, but it's not, it's not difficult. Uh, because packing problem, it also can be formulated as this uh, energy minimization problem for some suitable, like one way for this potential, it's that it, for example, energy is infinite if two points come too close together, and it's just zero if they are, if the distance is uh, enough. Of course, it's somehow it, it contradicts a little bit our rules for the potential, but but it's somehow but it's very close uh, to it's a limit of such yes. Yeah. And so let me t tell you now about like our like, our strategy of the proof. And so the key ingredient of the proof are the linear programming bounds, and I will introduce this technique in a moment. And so essentially what this uh, <coughs> method is, it means that we have this very difficult nonlinear problem uh, about, about point configurations. Uh, but we replace our difficult problem by an easier one, we re re relax it, so to say, by a different uh, a question, which we now ask not about uh, points on our space, but rather about functions on this space. And so the problem which we will study, it will be actually now, it will be certain convex problem in the space of uh, functions. And because it's a convex problem, here <laughs> this word linear programming comes from, which is a bit now strange and maybe also old-fashioned terminology. But at least it works very well in some nice cases, as I will tell, show you in a minute. And uh, as we have to work to do this uh, con convex problem in the space of functions, so it's convex, it's nice, but what now what is not so nice, that our problem becomes infinite dimensional. And for this, we will need some trivial facts from Fourier analysis. And in particular, we'll need to establish a new Fourier interpolation formula. And now the last piece of uh, our strategy, it is after we first uh, relax our problem to some convex problem, 
uh, which like, magically it turns out that even after relaxation we still get a precise result for this very nice E8 and Leach lattices. Then we do manage to solve this problem by introducing new Fourier techniques. Uh, what we were able to do, we will reduce our question about of universal optimality to some uh, to the proof of a positivity of some uh, function of two variables. And unfortunately, this step, we could not find a better way to solve it other than check it numerically. So the last would be the numerical verification. of positivity of a certain function. And for example, after some transformations, we can think of it as a function, for example, on a unit square. And so let me start with the first point, which would be the linear programming bounds. So here we'll need two technical uh, definitions. So one of them we will recall the definition of a Schwartz function. So Schwartz function on the Euclidean space, it is a function which is uh, infinitely differentiable. And also the function itself and uh, all its derivative, they decay faster than any inverse power. So, and also we know that And this will be true for all positive numbers alpha. For example, we can take them to be integers. And for all multi-indices beta. And here also one uh, piece of notation. So as we have to use a Fourier analysis, we have to introduce Fourier transform. And so here, just because there are several different conventions about how to write down the Fourier transform, I will write my favorite way of introducing it, and it's the following. So, and so here, by the dot, I will denote the usual scalar product, so standard inner product. Euclidean space. And so now when we have these uh, uh, notations, we can formulate what the linear programming is. And so this method is uh, used quite often in metric geometry and in analyzing uh, optimal configurations and so usually for each space for each uh, kind of problem there is a separate adaptation and so <coughs> Henry Cohn and Abhinav Kumar they've <coughs> developed a nice adaptation of linear programming to this energy minimization in Euclidean space So 
So again, let P be any function, any energy profile. So, but this time we do want it to be a uh, <coughs> repelling energy profile. So it will, we don't allow P to take negative values. And we suppose that f is a we are able to construct a Schwartz function and so we suppose that this Schwartz function uh, satisfies several nice conditions. So first we suppose that uh, f is bounded above by p. At all points except for 0. And also that the Fourier transform of f is non-negative. Then we know that then every configuration of Rd with density rho it will have lower p energy uh, which is at least this number, so it should be rho times the value of Fourier transform of f at point zero minus the value of f at point zero. So we have uh, obtained an estimate for uh, possible uh, p energy. And so now let me give you a short uh, proof of this statement. And so this is what I say that we have uh, somehow replaced our problem about uh, finding good con <coughs> about configurations of points by a convex problem uh, for functions. Because now our problem becomes just finding such suitable f. And the conditions which we have on f, they are convex conditions. So f has to satisfy uh, these two inequalities. And also this value has to be op optimal for us. <coughs> and in, in general, as we will see now in the proof, that uh, this is a, a sort of clearly a relaxation of our problem. So in, in general, what we obtained, uh, this, uh, the question about f, it is a weaker statement. It will just give us the uh, low, lower bound in most of the cases. But of course, will not replace our initial problem. And so let's do the proof. And so here now I will uh, just to make my life a bit easier, I will not do the proof for general configuration, but I will uh, prove this statement for periodic configurations. So suppose that C be a periodic, con be a lambda periodic configuration, and lambda is some lattice. So then we have the following. We can write the p energy of this configuration in the following way. So.
And so now, at this po point, we just used the computations which we have done uh, before when we considered periodic configurations. Uh, so now what we do, we can estimate this number from below uh, using the, pro the fact that uh, f does not exceed p. So we can write in the following way. And now, because f is already defined at 0, where p was not, we can rewrite this in the following slightly nicer way, maybe more symmetric. So we will write the sum over all x and y in c modulo lambda, not excluding the case where x is equal to y. Now the only term which we will have to subtract would be f of 0. And so now what we do at this point, we use the Poisson summation. So we rewrite our sum like this, and again, so here lambda star is a dual lattice. So it would be the set of all mu, such that mu times L is an integer for all elements of the initial lattice L. So this is the dual lattice. And so now we do maybe the somehow the most non-trivial part of the of, of our proof. So what we will do, we will replace this uh, double sum by uh, absolute value squared of a single sum. So. We leave our su summation over dual lattice, and so now here the trick comes. <coughs> so we have written a sum like this, and uh, so now. Okay, no, okay, yes, you're right. So the risky should be f hat of mu minus f of zero. Yes. Yeah, so I think now it's now it's correct. And so now a good thing which ca which we see here is that this uh, the absolute number squared, of course it's a non negative number. So here we can use uh, our Con uh, conditions from the theorem that the Fourier transform of f was uh, non-negative. Non so we can again estimate this number. Okay, maybe I'll do it on this blackboard. So now we throw away all the terms in our sum over the dual lattice, except of uh, the, <coughs> the one where mu equals to zero.
And so now this, uh, the, this sum of exp exponentials, if mu equals to zero, it's very easy to compute it. Uh, it will be just the number of uh, elements of C modulo lambda. And we have to take it squared. So. And now this is if we see that we can <coughs> can cancel something cancels out here, and what we will get we'll get the number of uh, elements in our configuration modulo lambda divided by the covolume of lambda, and this is just the density of the configuration. So. so this proves our state. Statement and so the general case where we consider not only periodic configurations, uh, it was actually uh, so general case was proven by Cohen and Corsi Island. And so now we can look at the proof and we what we try to see is uh, in which case we can hope for a sharp bound. So in the proof we have seen that uh, we, when we prove, so we could get a sharp uh, bound only if all the inequalities which we have written in our proof, they are actually equalities. And when by each of these estimates, we, we essentially did not lose anything. And again, some uh, by considering different case and doing numerical experiments, we do know that actually sharp obtaining sharp bound by this method it is a very rare occasion. So usually we get just some estimate, but this estimate is not good enough to completely resolve the problem. But still in some cases it does happen. We do get sharp bounds. So when can it happen? So again, suppose that, <coughs> so we make the following assumption. Suppose that lattice Suppose that our optimal configuration it is actually a lattice. And that it minimizes P energy. <coughs> for some P. And we suppose that this can be proven by constructing appropriate function f. So by the linear programming method. So it means that in all the our inequalities on that blackboard, we <coughs> we don't have any losses. So and so this gives us quite restrictive conditions on the function f. So first, we know that our function of x, it has to be equal to p of x for all uh, 
x which are in uh, in our lattice lambda. Uh, may maybe x except for zero. And also we know that the value of the Fourier transform of our function it has to be exactly zero for all y which are in the dual lattice again without zero And so now the question is, so uh, well something what we observed numerically is that actually in, in some cases uh, these conditions, knowing these two conditions, it is enough to uh, identify the Schwartz function f uniquely. So only by giving uh, these two kinds of rest restrictions, we can then reconstruct f at least in the space of Schwartz functions. And so, and so here is another result which I would like to present during these six lectures and hopefully also to prove it. So it is the following interpolation formula. So here maybe before I write the formula, so one more remark. So we see that uh, uh, these two conditions, uh, these two equalities have to hold, but also they have to hold to the second order be because of the inequalities which we have. So if our function p is nice and smooth, then it means that uh, f has to coincide with uh, p at all lattice points, but uh, it also ha it has to satisfy up to the also the first derivative has to satisfy uh, to coincide and the same happens for the Fourier transform because we know that uh, f at point uh, y is zero but also f hat it is a uh, non-negative so it means that it is <coughs> the derivative of f hat also has to vanish at this point and so now the question is whether we can reconstruct function by knowing its values and values of its Fourier transform and their first derivatives at some discrete set of points. And so suppose that d and n0 be either 8 and 1 or 24 and 2. Uh, then every f in the space of uh, radial Schwartz functions. So here we consider not uh, any Schwartz functions, but only Schwartz functions which are invariant under rotations around uh, zero. So any radial Schwartz function is uniquely determined by the following values. So we have to compute f of square root of 2n, its derivative at this point, then its Fourier transform, and the derivatives of its Fourier transform. And this should be, we know, we should know these numbers for all integers n which are bigger or equal than to number n0 and n0 it depends on a dimension. So if <coughs> dimension is 8 then n0 is 1 and if dimension is 24 then n0 is 2. And so more precisely we can write in the following way. 
we know that there exists an interpolation basis consisting of functions a n, b n, a n tilde and b n tilde, and they're all radial Schwartz functions. And again, so we have uh, such four, four sequences of numbers uh, with index n, which starts from n0. And so this basis is defined by the following property. So such that for, for every function f, and every x, we have the following formula. So I do not know this equation by if for interpolation formula. So we know that f of x equal to the following sum. So n goes from n0 to infinity. And here we have, okay, so uh, f of square root of 2n times a n of x plus its derivative. value of Fourier transform at this point. And so also what is important is that this series it will converge absolutely. Well, the convergence is not very difficult because we started with our function f, which was a Schwartz function, and it means that these values <coughs> over which we are interpolating, they are already decaying very fast. So the only thing we have to ensure that the values of these functions a n and b n and a n tilde and b n tilde, they don't grow too fast. For example, that they grow at most polynomially in index n for fixed x. And then we'll know that this uh, series converges. As the values of f of prime and Fourier transform are independent, just arbitrary sequences of fast decaying. Okay, so actually we proved that they can be arbitrary sequences. Uh, yeah, so identify Schwarz space. Yeah, yeah. So in if in actually in any dimension, if we take for example uh, Schwarz functions and consider these uh, its values, such for example all square roots of integers and um, its values and the same on the Fourier side, uh, we know that there will be some relations between these sequences, but there will be only finitely many, of, of not finitely many, but it will be a finite dimensional space of relations. And then it will be actually described by some uh, space of, uh, I would say, mod modular forms. Uh, or modular forms, like, in a bit general sense, but, yeah. But I will somehow uh, probably explain this on our next uh, lecture a bit more. And so, And so let me write a little bit about the properties of these functions uh, a n and uh, b n. So 
So it's uh, actually it follows from our claim that uh, this formula it is an in interpolation formula. For example, it should work for functions uh, a n and b n uh, th themselves. And so what does it mean that they are interpolating bases? So they have the following properties. So, so it means that for integers, any pair of integers m and n, which are bigger or equal to n0, uh, we know that, for example, functions a n if you evaluate them at points square root of 2m, so they will be, it will be, this value will be equal to 1 if n is equal to m, and it will be 0 otherwise. And at the same time, the derivatives of uh, this function, they will vanish, and the value of its Fourier transform at such points, they will also vanish. And the derivatives of the Fourier transform will also vanish. And for the function bn, we'll have a slightly different story. So here are the values of the function bn. They will vanish at all our chosen points. On the other hand, the derivatives, they will vanish everywhere except for one point where m is equal to n. And the values of Vn and the values of its the derivatives, they will both vanish on the Fourier side. And another useful symmetry here, it is that if the Fourier transform of An, it will be actually equal to the function at An tilde. And the Fourier transform of Vn, it will be equal to b n tilde. So the Fourier transform in all this is taken in one dimension, R square, or in R d? Oh no, no, it, it stay, it's taken in uh, R, R d. Yeah, but somehow, but we work with radial functions, so it's uh, in a sense it is. Uh, one can think of it that because uh, all our functions, they will think of them as a uh, d-dimensional function to take Fourier transform, but essentially they are one-dimensional. So this Fourier transform it could be replaced by some Bessel transform for one-dimensional functions. And the derivative is the derivative of the function of R squared. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so here the derivative it's actually the derivative of uh, uh, of one-dimensional function. So it's somehow ra ra radial der der derivative in radial direction. Thank you. <coughs> and so here maybe I will use some uh, notation. So we will den denote by lambda 8, this would be the E8 lattice. And lambda 24, this subindex 24, this would be the Leach lattice. So these are very famous mathematical objects, and maybe they don't need too much introduction. But I'll just uh, remind that uh, these both lattices, they are uh, even and unimodular lattices. And uh, so even it means that if we take any vector L in this lattice, then its Euclidean norm will be a square root of even integer. <coughs> and unimodular, it means that the covolume of the lattice is 1. And also one important fact is, is that the, so the shortest vector, or of course shortest non-zero non vector in lambda d, 
it will has length or has Euclidean norm square root of 2 and 0. Where in 0 is like in the formulation of our interpolation formula. And so now when we have an interpolation formula and we know this uh, properties of the op op optimal auxiliary function, what we can do, we can combine this together and construct our auxiliary function. And so, by combining uh, <coughs> what I have just said, so we now we see that the only possible uh, auxiliary function that could prove a sharp bound for for this fun for the lattice lambda d where d is either 8 or 24 at least uh, auxiliary function among among Schwartz functions would be the following one. So this would be the function f of x, which is the following sum. So Because we know that such a function that will uh, coincide with p up to second order in all <coughs> vectors of, uh, of, of, of lambda. And also it will uh, vanish at all the vectors of uh, as, as the Fourier transform of f. It will vanish at all the uh, non-zero vectors of the dual lattice, which in our case is actually the lattice itself. And so now, but now, of course, uh, we extracted this information only from knowing the equalities. But in, in the proof of uh, uh, Conan Elkis about linear programming, uh, we know that knowing equalities is not enough. We also have to prove the inequalities. And, and this is what will prove the universal, the universal optimality for us. So. So we also need to know what happens to the function f in all other points. So now So now it suffices to check <coughs> that f of x actually does not exceed p. <coughs> for all x, except for 0. And also the, the Fourier transform of f is not negative for all points y in the dimensional Euclidean space. So we need to have a picture which looks something like this. So
So if we have our potential, which looks like something like this, then our function f has to be like this. And uh, the Fourier transform has to be something like this. Just at all this, perhaps. The pure fact is exponent minus uh, uh, n constant and x square, yeah? Uh, yes, so, yeah, so th this, this we will do this for the ga Gaussians, right? And so, again, so this is as you said, so we'll re remember that. The lambda d, it is universally optima optimal. If and only if it is a ground state for all Gaussians. Or for all And so now a few words about how to how to approach this problem. So now we have to prove some inequalities for so now we, we do see where the proving positivity of a function of two variables comes from. So now we have somehow two variables here. One of them is alpha the exponent of a Gaussian, and another is x, which is a length of a vector. And we need to prove some inequalities on our function for all parameters x and alpha. And so, so how to do this, what would be very useful is to have an explicit formula for our function f, which somehow would be, we we'll also get it if we could have explicit formula, for example, for this, uh, for the interpolating basis functions. And so now, maybe by the, I'll finish. Two, yeah, yeah, okay, but now, okay, there, there is a trick which actually allows to do it only on one, on one side. I will maybe also show, show it to you now in, in a moment. But so let's, let's first, uh, I'll write down how to, first how to make these functions explicit so that we can work with them and prove inequalities. And second part is also how to, like instead of proving two inequalities, how to prove only one. So now we consider the, the following generating functions. <laughs> so we write it by f capital of tau and x, the following function. So First function, the function like this, and the second one, the function like this, the same only with tildes. And so here, uh, in these functions here, x, it will be a variable in our uh, Euclidean space. And tau, 
parameter tau, it's an element in the upper half plane, so it's a complex number with a positive imaginary part. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, maybe, maybe, yeah. Okay. The second signature, tilde opposite. Yes, yeah, I think it's like this. Yes, sorry. It should be tilde in the second term, B and T. We have tilde there. Uh, we have tilde there. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, I think also here will be to be like straight. And so now what we see that if we substitute tau to be i times uh, alpha, the purely imaginary number, then what we will get here, we'll get the function which we uh, had before. This will be this uh, auxiliary function for the Gaussian with parameter alpha. So now the inequalities, okay, maybe it's don't have enough of space here. Now the inequalities like so uh, capital F of I alpha X <laughs> smaller than equal E to the minus pi alpha X squared for all positive real alpha and all x in the Euclidean space. And now we can take the Fourier transform of this function, but we take a Fourier transform with respect to the second argument in the function. So we consider alpha just as a parameter and compute the Fourier transform. Again, for all alpha and for all y in the Euclidean space. And so now these inequalities, they uh, will imply the universal optimality of the lattice lambda d. All the lattice we're interested in. And so, <coughs> and so here now, I will show you a trick which helps us to compute this function capital F of uh, tau and x exp explicitly. And therefore, it will also help us to find, for example, the interpolating basis and the auxiliary functions we are interested in. <laughs> and so the trick is uh, the following. So now what we can do, we can apply our interpolation formula to the complex Gaussian. So the uh, Gaussian with, uh, yes? Yes, we have a question. Is this an i in front of alpha in the second f hat? Uh, yes, it's also i. So what uh, we do now, we want to, so, okay. so we now in apply interpolation formula which is now in the middle upper blackboard to the following function, to the complex Gaussian, p with index tau of x, it would be e to the minus 
phi i tau Euclidean norm of x squared. And then <laughs> what we will see, so th it is equivalent to the following expression, which involves our generating functions, capital F and capital tilde. So it's equivalent to saying that 2 e pi i tau times the, <coughs> the Euclidean norm of x squared equals to the F capital F of tau x plus the following. And now because the uh, uh, Fourier transform acts nicely on Gaussians, so here as a, from the last uh, two terms in our in interpolating formula, we will get also not exactly the capital F tilde, but the function which is closely related to it. So it's the function which is obtained by capital F tilde by a simple modular transformation fun function like this. So we have got a fun fun functional equation which looks like this. And we secretly actually we have also two other functional equations for these two functions. So secretly we also have, we also know that uh, the <coughs> this bo both functions, they are, so to say, linearly periodic. We know that if we take f of tau plus 1 x minus 2 f of, if we take the second difference with respect to tau, so this will vanish. And the same will happen for the capital tilde, for the capital F tilde. Oh yes, minus one over tau, thank you. Yes, minus one over tau. Second line? Yes, plus we think. Yes. Well, the Kyrgyz tau is an element in the upper plane. And so now we have these uh, free equa equations for f and f tilde. And now these free equations, they actually they allow us to find uh, these functions explicitly. And this is something we will speak about on, the, on our next lecture tomorrow. Mm, yes, 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 yes. So somehow, somehow, because we want our interpolation formula to to be convergent, so this gives us already some gross assumptions on f, and these functional equations together with gross assumptions, they will allow us found f and f tilde explicitly. And so I think I have one uh, minute left, so I can maybe show you how to, instead of proving two inequalities, how can we prove only one inequality. So now we can see that actually if we prove this inequality, it will also apply this one. And it follows from the uh, functional equation and the fact that the Fourier transform of capital F with respect to the second argument will be just F tilde. So. Last remark for today is that so <coughs> the inequal this inequality f of i y bigger or equal zero for now it implies that f of i alpha x is actually bounded by e to the minus p alpha again for all
And so how do we see it? We see it from first, we know that if we take F capital, this would be just F tilde of uh, And this formally this follows from the properties of the uh, functions in the interpolating basis. It will follow from, from this property. And second, what we just have to use, we have to use the functional equation. So. so we know that f of i alpha x, it will be equal to the e minus pi alpha, the <coughs> Euclidean norm of x squared minus uh, this number And so here we use the fact that f tilde is actually equal to the Fourier transform of f. And here we use the fact that our d is divisible by 8. The dimension is divisible by 8. And so here at this step, we can use our assumption, which we have made. So we see that this is bounded by the exponential, by the, sorry, by the Gaussian. And this is exactly what we needed to prove. So instead of proving two inequalities, we actually need to prove only one of them. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. the, the AM tilde are not the Fourier transforms of, of the AM, are they? Uh, okay, so I did not formulate it like this uh, in the theorem, but it, but it is actually the, the, the property. Yes, yes. Yes? I don't want to spoil the next lecture, but if you want to answer, uh, I'd like to understand. In the theorem on the top row, the n0 is equal to 1 and n0 equal to 2 have nothing to do with the lattice at this stage, right? Okay, so they actually have to do with dimension. Right. So uh, it's amazing that the least lattice uh, comes out special. And if I follow your experience, I would say, I would guess that uh, the other lattices that one might have looked at, like E8, two, twice the E8 or D16 or the 23 Niemeyer lattices, don't satisfy this, so they will not work. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, the so uh, divisibility by 8 is, is just a small part of the story. Well, of course, of course, yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah. And also, <coughs> we still hope that something, if we something, you know, something is going on with, for example, in dimension 2 and also in dimension 1, so, yeah. Somehow, okay, so arithmetic properties are important, but I think they're quite subtle here. I yes. also have a question about interpolation formula. So, are there other D and N nodes for which it works? I think okay, so. Actually, it works for every dimension, <laughs> with some. Okay, so maybe, of course, like like, like this N zero, it will always d depend on a, on a dim on dimension, and this number it can be actually like how exactly it depends. It can be described by dimension of some space of modular forms. And it's also like what's a bit special about in this case, which might not always be true, is that like, for example, here we can start our formula from uh, the same number and zero everywhere. And in general, it could happen that, yeah, like, uh, like the to total this, like, deficit in dimension is not divisible by four, and then we have to divide, like maybe they take, I don't know, more values on Fourier side or more uh, derivatives. So is it possible to find explicitly this function f capital for any dimension? Mm, yes, okay, so, so there are also some, I think in, in a sense it is, uh, you have to make some choices, like for example, to choose where to start your summation. Mm -hmm. And after that, yeah, it, it, is, it is possible. 
So you only need to specify these two pairs because there are examples of the lattices. Uh, yes, yes, because I mean because there are also some maybe not so pleasant technical details, details which you did not want to work them in, like in a full generality. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but, but we concentrated on these two cases only because because of our application.